neuro-ophthalmology. A very fascinating topic, challenging topic, and I can definitely say at least few MCQs will come from neuro-ophthalmology for your specialty entrance exam from either ophthalmology or neurology, or it could be general medicine. Neuro-ophthalmology consists of both ocular movement and vision. Neuro-ophthalmology consists of both ocular movement and vision. A moving object evokes ocular movement and almost simultaneously arouses attention and initiates the perceptive process. Hence, ocular movement and vision are virtually inseparable. But today we will talk about ocular movement, very fascinating but challenging concepts. Ocular movement, abnormalities of ocular movements are basically of two types. One, the nuclear or the infranuclear. Second, the supranuclear or internuclear palsy. Ocular movement basically is done by ocular motor nerves, the third nerve, fourth nerve and sixth nerve. The third nerve, fourth nerve and sixth nerve. The three, four and six with eight are interconnected by a tract known as medial longitudinal fasciculus. Above the three, four, six nerves, we have the supranuclear pathways, namely saccadic pathway and pursuit pathways. So if there's an ocular movement disorder, it could be either in the supranuclear pathways, the pathways coming and connecting to the third, fourth and sixth nerves, or it could be an internuclear ophthalmoplegia, medial longitudinal fasciculus connecting the third, fourth and sixth nerves, or it could be infranuclear, that is third, fourth, sixth nerves per se. Now we shall see in detail the each uh, abnormality. But before that, I want to talk about two very, very important concepts, most important concepts to differentiate an infranuclear palsy from a supranuclear palsy. The nuclear or infranuclear palsy, this disorder of motility can be traced to a lesion of the extraocular muscles themselves, the neuromuscular junction or the cranial nerves that supply them. This disorder produces diplopia, double vision. Diplopia is not present in supranuclear palsy. Very, very important concepts. If third, fourth or sixth nerves per se are affected, there'll be double vision. If third nerves are affected, they cause adduction, so there'll be a problem with adduction, so they'll have double vision on looking at near objects. If sixth nerve gets affected, the lateral rectus gets affected, so they'll have double vision on looking at far off objects. So if third, fourth or sixth nerves per se are affected, there will be double vision. Whereas if it is supranuclear pathway, that is the saccadic pathway or pursuit pathway, which connects the third, fourth, sixth nerves, if they get affected, there is no diplopia, there is no double vision. Because supranuclear palsy causes a gaze palsy. Either the eyes move together or the eyes do not move at all. So there is a synchronous movement or no synchronous movement at all. Since they are synchronous, there is no double vision. So very, very important point. The first point I would like to tell is that supranuclear palsy does not produce double vision. Whereas infranuclear palsy, like third, fourth, sixth nose, they produce double vision or diplopia. Third now produces double vision on looking at near objects. Sixth now produces double vision on looking far off objects. Very important concepts to differentiate supranuclear palsy from intranuclear palsy. The second important concept is that the supranuclear or internuclear palsy, there's a derangement in the highly specialized neural mechanisms that enable the eyes to move together. In patients who cannot elevate their eyes voluntarily, the presence of reflex upward deviation of the eyes in response to forced flexion of the head, known as doll's head movement, usually indicates that the nuclear and infranuclear mechanisms for upgaze are intact and that the defect is supranuclear. So what does this mean? Doll's eye movement is the movement is that when you turn the head to the right, the eyes will go to the left. When you turn the head to the left, the eyes will go to the right. Suppose a person has got an ocular movement disorder. What you have to do is that try to turn the head to the right and see whether the eyes are moving to the left. If when turning to the head to the right, the eyes are moving to the left, that means the infranuclear mechanisms are intact. Third, fourth and sixth nerves are intact. That means the defect is supranuclear. So supranuclear gaze palsy, if there's an eye movement disorder, it can be overcome by doll's eye movement. 
Whereas if it is an intranuclear palsy, that is third, fourth, sixth cranial nose per se, it cannot be overcome by doll's eye movement. Even if you turn the head to one side, the eyes will not go to the other side because sixth nose, third nose per se are affected. So by these two important bedside clinical fascinating concepts, we can differentiate whether it is supranuclear or intranuclear. The first point is that supranuclear palsy does not produce double vision, whereas intranuclear palsy does produce double vision. The second point is that supranuclear palsy can be overcome by doll side movement or vestibular st stimulation, whereas intranuclear palsy cannot be overcome by doll side movement or vestibular ocular reflex. Yeah. Supra, we'll first start off with supranuclear and then we'll go to internuclear and then infranuclear eye movement disorder. Supra, supranuclear control of eye movement. There are basically two types. One conjugate movement of gaze, that means eyes going together or eyes do not go at all. That is conjugate movement. Disconjugate movement means they go in opposite directions. So either both they come together or both they go wide apart. The conjugate movement or gaze, conjugate means yoked or joined together. The symmetrical and synchronous movements of the eyes are known as the conjugate movement. It could be saccades. What is saccades? Suppose I am looking at the camera, someone knocks at the door, I immediately turn to the right and see who is knocking at the door. These fast movements going to one side are known as saccades. It originates from the left front life fields area number eight, goes to the PPRF on the right. The paramedian pontine reticular formation connects the sixth nerve lateral rectus on one side and medial rectus through MLF on the opposite side. So when my left front life fields area number eight is stimulated, the PPRF on the opposite side is stimulated so my eyes will turn fast to the right. This is known as saccades, the fast movement. Very, very important because when the left frontal eye feels area number eight gets affected, the person cannot move the eyes to the opposite side. Eyes will be looking to one side, but hemiplegia will be on the opposite side. So eyes looking to one side, hemiplegia on the opposite side is a frontal lobe infarct. Whereas from frontal eye fields area number eight, it goes to the PPRF on the opposite side. So if pons gets affected, it cannot pull the eyes to its side. So eyes will go to the opposite side. Hemiplegia is also on the opposite side. So eyes looking to the same side of hemiplegia is a pontine infarct. Eyes looking to one side and hemiplegia on the opposite side is a frontal lobe infarct. Very interesting concept. At the bedside, you can pick it up. So basically, we have saccadic movement, the very fast, direct, very fast movement. That is saccad, originating from front life fields area number eight, going to the contralateral PPRF. The second type of movement is known as smooth pursuit movement. Here. The target is a moving object. Suppose this is a pen. I The pen goes like this and I'm following the pen. These following movements are known as pursuit eye movements. The following eye movement. For example, you see a nice shuttlecock match going on. You follow the shuttle. These following movements are known as pursuit eye movements. They originate from the pareto occipital cortex. There is double crossing. It goes to the cerebellum on the opposite side and then comes back to the PPRF. So finally, it supplies the ipsilateral PPRF. So saccadic movement originates from the front life fields, goes to the contralateral PPRF, whereas pursuit movement comes from the ipsilateral paratoxidal cortex and supplies PPRF on the same side because of double crossing. And the third final movement, very interesting, is the vestibulo-ocular reflex. For example, if I turn my head to one side or if I pour warm water, what happens? When I turn to right side, this is otherwise known as doll side movement. When I turn my head to the right side, I'm stimulating my vestibular complex. It goes and connects to the PPRF on the opposite side. So eyes will move to the opposite side. This is known as doll side movement or vestibular ocular reflex, which we've been, which we've seen in uh, young children. When we are young children, we are playing with dolls. When you turn the doll to one side, the eyes goes to the opposite side. When you, tall, when you turn the head of the doll to the other side, the eyes go to the opposite side. Likewise, when you turn the head to one side, you're stimulating the vestibular apparatus. It goes and connects to the PPRF on the opposite side. So PPRF will pull the eyes towards its side. So eyes will go to the opposite side. So this is doll Simon. Turning the head to one side, eyes going to the opposite side. So when you put warm water and you turn the head to one side, you're stimulating the vestibular apparatus. Eyes goes to the opposite side. So front life fields area number eight now tries to connect it, correct it, and tries to put it back so they'll have nystagmus. So when you turn the head to one side or when you pour warm water, eyes goes to the opposite side by nystagmus is to the same side. When you put cold water, you are inhibiting the vestibular apparatus. Example on the right side, this vestibular apparatus will now get stimulated. So eyes will go to the opposite side. 
but nystagmus will be to the same side because front lifeal area number eight will try to correct. This is beautifully explained by the acronym COWS, C O W S. Warm, the nystagmus is to same side, cold, the nystagmus to the opposite side. So when I stimulate the vestibular apparatus by turning the head to one side or by pouring warm water, eyes goes to the opposite side. If the eyes do not go to the opposite side, that means PPRF is affected. That means third and sixth nerves are affected. That means it's a brainstem pathology, especially pontine pathology. But if eyes goes to one side, but there is no corrective nystagmus, that means it's a frontal lobe pathology. Front life fields area number eight is affecting and it is not able to push the eyes to the opposite side. So by simple bedside, bedside test, vestibular ocular reflex, we get wealth of information. When you put warm water or when you turn the head to one side and stimulate it, if the eyes, eyes should go to the opposite side and nystagmus should be there to the same side, warm, same side. If the eyes do not go to the opposite side, that means PPRF or the third, or four, third and sixth nerves are affected. Eyes goes to one side, but there's no nystagmus. Frontal lobe is affected like metabolic encephalopathy, like hyponatremia or hypoxemia. So these are the supranuclear conjugate pathways. The saccadic pathway, that means the fast pathway coming from the front life fields area number eight, going to the contralateral PPRF. The pursuit pathway, that is a slow following movement coming from the ipsilateral parieto-occipital cortex because of double crossing going to the same side PPRF. Third is the vestibular ocular reflex. When you put warm water, the eyes goes to the opposite to the opposite side, but the nystagmus by the front life fields area number eight will be to the same side. So we have three pathways in conjugate movement or case, saccadic, pursuit, vestibular ocular reflex. Now we shall go to the disconjugate movement, the simultaneous movements of the eyes in the opposite direction. We have convergence, we have divergence, and we have accommodation, which also has accommodation prior. Yeah, now we shall talk about supranuclear eye control of gaze. The supranuclear mechanisms that control gaze are designed to ensure that the fovea maintains fixation on the object of interest, despite the movement of the object, the eyes, or the head. A saccade, as I said, jerk is a quick, small, amplitude eye movement to acquire a target. Saccades are designed to shift rapidly gaze to the target. So fast movement is the saccade, whereas pursuit movement are the slow following movement. Pursuit movements are slow, smooth eye movements to track a target once acquired. Like when I follow the pen, I keep following the pen. Pursuit movements are designed to maintain foveation of a moving target. This is a very, very important concept. Everyone has to know it. What are the gaze centers? What is the gaze center for all horizontal eye movements? What is the gaze center for all vertical eye movements? The sixth nerve nucleus and the PPRF, paramedian pontine reticular formation, is the final pathway controlling all horizontal eye movements, whether it is saccades or pursuit. The final pathway, the final pathway to control is PPRF. Therefore, the center for all horizontal eye movements is pons. I repeat, the center for all horizontal eye movements is pons. The vertical gaze centers lie in the midbrain. Therefore, the center for all vertical eye movements, whether up gaze or down gaze, is midbrain. So, midbrain is the center for all vertical eye movements. Pons is the center for all horizontal eye movements. Very important. I can tell this with a with a, with a good clinical example. We have a syndrome known as locked-in syndrome, wherein the pons gets affected. When the pons gets affected, the corticobulbar corticospinal fibers are affected. So person is quadriplegic and the pons is center for all horizontal eye movements. So person, when the pons gets affected, he cannot move the eyes horizontally. But since midbrain is intact, the vertical movements are intact. So what is locked in syndrome? Person cannot use his upper limbs, lower limbs. He cannot move his eyes horizontally because pons is affected. But since midbrain is intact, the vertical eye movements are spared. So the center for all horizontal eye movements is pons, that is the PPRF. And the center for all vertical eye movements, vertical gaze is midbrain. Very, very important concept. Yeah. These are the saccadic and pursuit pathways. The saccadic pathways, I have put it in the red and pursuit pathways, I have put it in the blue. You can see it on the screen. So the saccadic pathways, for example, on, I'm talking about movement to the right side, it originates from the left frontal eye fields area number eight. It originates from the left frontal eye fields area number eight and then descends and goes to the opposite PPRF. 
from PPRF, it goes to the sixth nerve nuclei where it goes and supplies the right lateral rectus and through the MLF, it goes and supplies the third rectus and goes to the medial rectus. So finally, what happens when the left front life fields area number eight is stimulated, eyes will go to the right side. It has also got connections with the basal ganglia. You can see it here and the superior colliculus. That's why in persons with basal ganglia disease like Parkinson's disease, they can have eye movement disorders. And the one on the this side, which I colored it in blue is the pursuit pathways. It comes from the parieto temporo occipital cortex. It goes to the pontine nucleus. And from there, it crosses over to the cerebellum on the opposite side. From the cerebellum, it goes to the vestibular nucleus, again from the vestibular nucleus back to the PPRF and sixth nerve nucleus. So because of this double crossing, it connects the PPRF ipsilaterally. So pursuit movements are responsible for slow falling movements. Saccadic movements are responsible for all horizontal eye movements. And cerebellum goes and connects the vestibular nu nucleus, which goes and connects to the PPRF. So cerebellum inhibits vestibular nucleus. So if vestibular stimulation, the eyes goes to the opposite side. If we stimulate cerebellum, it inhibits the vestibular connections and eyes goes to the same side. So cerebellum inhibits the vestibular ocular reflex. Yeah. So this is an overview of saccadic pathway and pursuit pathway. Now let's go in detail the saccadic pathway. As I said, you can see it in the diagram. It starts from the front life fields area number eight. Slowly it descends from the front life fields area number eight. It slowly descends in the midbrain internal capsule and goes to the PPRF on the opposite side. So PPRF connects the sixth nerve nucleus on the same side and with MLF on the opposite side. And therefore its movement is to push the eyes to the opposite side. Yeah. So front life fields area number eight to the superior collicular pathways are likely involved in reflex saccades. Signals from the PPRF activate both the motor neuron sixth nerve and interneurons MLF and third in the adjacent sixth nerve nucleus. The sixth nerve nucleus motor nucleus activate the ipsilateral rectus, lateral rectus, whereas the interneurons simultaneously send impulses to the MLF, which decussates and runs to the medial rectus subnucleus of the contralateral ocular motor nucleus in the midbrain to activate the medial rectus. So the ipsilateral lateral rectus and the contralateral medial rectus then contact synchronously to produce the horizontal movement. Another system involved in saccades works through the basal ganglia. So collaterals from the front life fields area number eight go to the head of the caudate nucleus and putamen, which send fibers to the ipsilateral substantia nigra. Neurons in the paradreticular project to the supra superior colliculus, which then project to the PPRF. So disturbance in the system like Parkinson's may explain some of the abnormalities of oculomotor control that occurs in basal ganglia disorders, particularly Parkinson's disease. Yeah, as I said in the, in the initially, an acute lesion of the frontal lobe, such as an infarct, usually causes impersistence or paralysis of contralateral gaze, and the eyes will turn involuntarily towards the side of the cerebral lesion. So eyes looking to one side and hemiplegia on the opposite side is a frontal lobe lesion because of the saccadic pathway involvement. Whereas if a lesion in the pontine horizontal gaze complex PPRF involving the abducens nucleus causes ipsilateral gaze palsy and the deviation of the eyes to the opposite side, so eyes will be deviated to the opposite side, hemiplegia is on the opposite side because the corticospinal tract descends in the pond at the level of the medial oblong, it crosses and goes to the opposite side. So it is also on the opposite side. So eyes looking towards the side of hemiplegia is a pontine lesion. Eyes looking to one side and hemiplegia on the opposite side is a frontal lobe lesion. Yeah, pursuit pathway, as I just explained, the smooth pursuit pathway starts in the parietotemporal occipital junction and functions to maintain foveation of a moving target. It comes from the peritotemporal occipital connections, goes to the cerebellum on the opposite side, from the cerebellum to the vestibular nucleus, and again back to the PPRF. Because of this double crossing, pursuit movement controls eye movements on the same side. And cerebellum has got a control. It tries to inhibit the vestibular reflex. So cerebellum also, if the cerebellum is affected, there will be manifestations in the form of ocular movement disorders. This system then double decusses. The dorsolateral pontine nucleus goes to the contralateral cerebellum. Signals from the cerebellum then activate the medial vestibular nucleus, which in turn project to the contralateral PPRF. The PPRF then coordinates the horizontal pursuit movements. 
The smooth pursuit movement to the right is controlled by the right occipital region. Quick refixation circuits back to the left are mediated by the right FEF so that the process of following a series of movements as in optokinetic nystagmus or railroad nystagmus is all accomplished in the same cerebral hemisphere. For example, when I'm, what is optokinetic nystagmus? When we sit in the, in the train, for example, near the window, when we follow all the scenery, what happens? You keep following. At the end, again, it comes back. You keep following and then it comes back. So a pursuit movement followed by a second. A pursuit movement followed by a refixation second. So pursuit movements are done by the parietal lobe and the seconds are done by the frontal lobe on the same side. Parietal lobe, if it is stimulated, that is pursuit movements on the same side. If front life feels area number eight is stimulated, the seconds is to the opposite side. So pursuit second, pursuit second. This is known as optokinetic nystagmus. Optokinetic nystagmus is very, very important, especially to rule out non-organic visual loss. As long as a person is able to see, they will have optokinetic nystagmus. So if a person comes with non-organic visual loss, person comes and tells, sir, I'm not able to see, but you know that person is lying. You want to confirm the non-organic visual loss. So how do you check it out at the bedside? You make a rotating drum with the black and white stripes and rotate it in front of the patient. The patient says, sir, I'm not able to see what you're doing. Even then you said, no problem. If you, even if you are not seeing, just look at the front, I'm rotating a drum. So he keeps seeing. Though he, has, he pretends that he is blind, he's actually seeing. So the moment the black and white stripes start rotating on the drum, he unknowingly starts following with a refixation second, following refixation second. That means he would develop optokinetic nystagmus. So presence of optokinetic nystagmus rules out blindness. So very interesting. With a simple test, you can make out whether he's blind, whether he's really blind or non-organic visual loss. So presence of optokinetic nystagmus rules out blindness. Yeah, very important. Another supranuclear pathway, as I said, is the vestibular ocular reflex. So here you can see the vestibular ocular reflex. You can see here the front life fields area number eight is also going to the PPRF. And the vestibular apparatus is also going to the PPRF. Whereas this is a fast pathway, whereas this is a slow pathway, pursuit movement. So when the front life fields area number eight is stimulated, the PPRF on the opposite side gets stimulated, the eyes will move to the fast side, to the fast side. When the vestibular apparatus is also stimulated, the eyes will move slowly to the opposite side. So when the vestibular apparatus is stimulated, the eyes will move slowly to the opposite side. When the front life fields area number eight is stimulated, the eyes will move in the fast manner, seconds. So when the vestibular apparatus is stimulated by turning the head to one side or by pouring warm water, the eyes will go slowly to the opposite side. But the front life fields area number eight will try to compensate by putting the eyes back, you will get nystagmus. So front life fields, if you put warm water, eyes will go to the opposite side, the nystagmus will be to the same side. If you put cold water, the eye movement will be to this side, the nystagmus will be opposite side, beautifully explained by the mnemonic cows. Yeah. So far, I've been talking about the horizontal eye movements, vestibular apparatus, and the front life fields area number eight. Now we'll check out on the vertical gaze. As I said in the beginning of my lecture, the horizontal eye center is the pons. The center for all vertical eye movements is the midbrain. The pathways controlling up gaze and down gaze course in the, in the region of the rostral midbrain, pretectum, posterior commissure. We have interstitial nucleus of Kajal. We have rostral interstitial nucleus of MLF. Here again, a very, very important concept. First is that the center for all vertical gaze is midbrain. The vertical eye movements are two types. One is the up gaze, second is the down gaze. Up gaze fibers cross and then descend, whereas down gaze fibers descend straight away. Here you can see in the diagram, up gaze fibers cross through the posterior commissure and then descends, whereas down gaze fibers descend straight away. So when there's a lesion which is impinging on the top of the midbrain, like hydrocephalus or perinot syndrome, dorsal midbrain syndrome. It goes and impinges the crossing up gaze fibers, but not the down gaze fibers, which descend straight away, ipsilaterally. So when it goes and impinges on the crossing up gaze fibers, they cannot look upwards. They'll be only looking downwards. This is known as sunset sign or up gaze palsy. So in persons with, with hydrocephalus, 
persons cannot look upwards, they'll be only looking downwards. It is known as up gaze palsy because the up gaze fibers cross over and then descend, whereas down gaze fibers descend straight away. So you get this sunsets in hydrocephalus or dorsal midbrain syndrome known as perinot syndrome. Very, very important concept and which, which explains why up gaze palsies are more common than the down gaze palsies because up gaze palsy fibers cross over and descend, whereas down gaze fibers descend straight away. So the vertical gaze equivalent of the PPRF is the rostral interstitial nucleus of the MLF, which lies in the midbrain near the red nucleus. The lateral portion of the rostral interstitial nucleus, MLF is concerned with the up gaze, the medial portion of the down gaze. The rostral interstitial nucleus impulses send impulses to the nuclei of the third and fourth, no, fourth nose. The up gaze lies more dorsally. Lesions of the region of the posterior commission may disturb vertical gaze, especially the up gaze, perinot syndrome. The down gaze fiber centers lie more ventrally and lesions there may primarily affect down gaze. Vertical saccades are generated by burst neurons in the rostral interstitial nucleus of the MLF with the unilateral innervation of the depressor muscle with, and bilateral innervation of the elevator muscles. And bilateral INC or posterior commission lesion causes defects of the vertical gaze. Yeah. Here, again, you can see that the up gaze fibers cross over and then down gaze fibers descend straight away. And again, here you can see the vestibular nucleus has got connections with the third and fourth, third and fourth nose nucleus through medial longitudinal fasciculus. Vestibular nucleus goes and connects third, fourth nose through medial longitudinal fasciculus. So any disturbance of this pathway, especially from the autolith pathway, the third and fourth nose get affected. So the eye movements may, one may go up, the other may go down, which is known as Q deviation. One eye going up, the other eye going down because the autolith pathway goes from the autoliths, runs to the MLF and goes to the third and fourth nose, right from the medulla oblongata and the vestibular nucleus. So a lesion anywhere in the medulla oblongata to the midbrain or coming from the cerebellum, which has got influences on the vestibular nucleus, as I said, can produce skew deviation. One eye going up, the other guy going down. Superior rectus, superior oblique, inferior rectus, and inferior oblique. So superior rectus up, superior oblique in torsion, inferior rectus down, and inferior oblique extorsion. So like this, it can go. This is known as Q deviation. And when it get irritates or it becomes unstable, you have seesaw nystagmus coming like this, coming like this. Especially in the optic chiasma lesions, you have the seesaw nystagmus. This is beautifully explained by this concept, wherein the MLF, which is concerned with vertical gaze running from the vestibular nucleus in the medial oblongata right going up to the midbrain and thalamus and therefore any lesion in the thalamus midbrain or medial oblongata or the cerebellum which controls the vestibular ocular reflex if they get affected there can be skew deviation one eye going up the other eye going down because superior rectus superior oblique inferior rectus and inferior oblique upwards in torsion downwards extorsion or it can be unstable it can produce seesaw nystagmus especially in the optic chiasma lesions As I said, very important is that midbrain is the center for vertical gaze, pons is the center for horizontal gaze. So we have a very interesting syndrome, locked in syndrome. In persons with locked in syndrome, pons is affected, which damages the horizontal gaze. Corticospinal fibers are affected, which causes weakness of all forums. However, midbrain is spared, and therefore vertical eye movements are preserved. Bell's phenomenon. When we close our eyelids, the eyeball goes upwards. It's a normal phenomenon. When we close the eyelids, the eyeball goes upwards. Bell's phenomenon is a normal, normal phenomenon, but I can't see in persons with, with, uh, normally because once they close their eye, eyelids, I can't see whether the eyes are going upwards or not. But generally, when we close the eyelids, the eyeball goes upwards. This is known as Bell's phenomenon. But in persons with Bell's palsy, element palsy, they cannot close the eyelids. But the moment they attempt to close the eyelids, the reflex comes into into action and you can see eyeballs moving upwards. So Bell's phenomenon is a normal phenomenon, but well seen in persons with Bell's palsy. Reflex up gaze occurs with forceful eyelid closure, Bell's phenomenon. In some conditions, reflex up gaze may be preserved when up gaze is otherwise paralyzed. What is the mechanism? The levator palpebrae superior is concerned with the eyelid opening and the superior rectus, which is concerned with the eyeball moving upwards are normally matched. 
in extreme down case both are inhibited levator palpebrae superior is, is inhibited so there is ptosis superior rectus is inhibited so eyes goes down so when eyelid is closed when they are looking down eyelid closes and eyes goes upwards but when they look upwards the normal parallel innervation becomes re reversed so when they look upwards it becomes reversed so levator palpebrae superior is, is inhibited so there is ptosis but superior rectus is this time is stimulated it goes upwards so what is the explanation for Bell's phenomenon? Levator palpebrae superioris and superior rectus muscle tone are normally matched. In extreme down gaze, both are maximally inhibited. But in reflex up gaze, the normal parallel innervation becomes reserve, reversed, and therefore levator palpebrae superioris is inhibited, whereas superior rectus goes upwards. The ball, the eyeball goes upwards because of superior rectus, and this is the explanation for Bell's phenomenon. Yeah. So far, I've been talking about the supranuclear pathway. That means the pathways involved with the connection of third, fourth, sixth nerves. Now I'm going to talk about internuclear pathway disorders. That means medial longitudinal fasciculus connecting third, fourth, and sixth nerves. This is known as internuclear ophthalmoplegia. The medial longitudinal fasciculus extends from the midbrain down to the upper thoracic spinal cord. Its primary function is to coordinate lateral gaze by connecting sixth nerve on one side with the third and fourth nerve nuclei on the opposite side in order to allow the eyes to move synchronously. Have you ever observed that various permutations and combinations are possible with our eye? For example, I can look to the right using my right lateral rectus and left medial rectus, or look to the left by using my left lateral rectus or right medial rectus, which is supported by third and sixth, or both medial rectus, third now, or both lateral right, sixth, sixth now. How am I able to use these different uh, permutations and combinations of the eye because of the connecting track medial longitudinal fasciculus, which connects third now? fourth nerve and sixth nerve with eighth nerve nucleus and even proprioceptors of eye of, of neck muscles. Because of this, there's an excellent coordination between various nuclei and even proprioceptors. So the lesions of the MLF disrupt communication between the two nuclei, sixth nerve nuclei and third nerve nuclei causing internuclear ophthalmoplegia. The MLF also has extensive connections and coordinates the movements of the two eyes as well as the head and eye and even body movements. Are very important. See, here you can see the MLF and the PPRF. The PPRF, as I said, is concerned with eye movement to each side. So the PPRF, if it gets stimulated, lateral rectus and the medial rectus get stimulated. So this is one movement, half movement, half movement. So PPRF is responsible for one movement to each side. For example, PPRF is stimulated, lateral rectus, medial rectus. Whereas MLF goes and connects the sixth nerve with the third nerve. So its primary function is to connect the third nerve nucleus, the medial rectus. So MLF goes and connects the third nerve nucleus, medial rectus. So if the PPRF gets affected, one movement gone, half movement and half movement. If MLF gets affected, medial rectus on that side get affected. This half movement is gone. So when there's a combined lesion of MLF and PPRF, one movement plus half movement is gone. This is known as one and half syndrome. A very important MCQ question again. So if the MLF gets affected, half movement gone, PPRF gets affected, one movement gone, both are gone on the same side, one and half movements are gone, and only half movement is present is abduction, and that too there is nystagmus. Why is there nystagmus? It is because of Herring's law of dual and equal innervation. Yoke muscles get equal supply. The left medial rectus and right lateral rectus get equal supply. So when the MLF gets affected, when the medial rectus gets affected, it cannot move the eye. So there's overstimulation on the yoke muscle, right lateral rectus. So there is nystagmus. So this is the explanation of the nystagmus. It produces abducting nystagmus. Again, an important uh, MC question. Usually nystagmus we describe as bilateral. But here is one condition where there's an unilateral nystagmus, abducting nystagmus, where you see in internuclear ophthalmoplegia, very characteristic of multiple sclerosis. So another question they may ask is one end of syndrome. What is one end of syndrome? One movement gone because of PPRF, half movement gone because of MLF. The only half movement present is on the opposite side, abduction. And that too, there is nystagmus because of Herring's law of equal, dual, equal innervation, dual innervation. So one end of syndrome is due to combined lesion of the MLF and the PPRF on the same side. The patient's only horizontal eye movement is abduction of the eye on the other side. That too, there is nystagmus. Yes, now supranuclear is over, internuclear is over. Now we are coming to the intranuclear, that means third, fourth, sixth nerves involvement per se. 
Now this is this easy, third, fourth, six. Only understanding supranuclear is challenging, but very exciting. Now let me talk about third, fourth, and sixth nerves. By convention, the term oclomotor nerve refers to cranial nerves, third, fourth, and sixth, and the term oclomotor nerve refers specifically to the third nerves. So when I say oclomotor nerves, it is three, four, six nerves. When I say only oclomotor nerve, it refers to the third nerve. The nerve system attempts to maintain visual fixation of images by controlling precisely the movements of the two eyes. The extraocular muscles work in pairs that are yoked together and work in concert to perform a certain action. So what are the actions of the extraocular muscles? We have the medial rectus response for adduction supplied by the third nerve. We have the lateral rectus abduction supplied by the sixth nerve. Superior rectus, the primary action is elevation, but the secondary action is intorsion supplied by the third nerve. The inferior rectus primary action is depression. The secondary action is extorsion supplied by the third nerve. The superior oblique primary action is intorsion. The secondary action is depression opposite because the direction goes in opposite way. So obliques, the names and the action performs are opposite because it goes in oblique direction. So superior oblique causes depression, not elevation. Very important concept. So superior oblique causes intorsion and depression. Inferior oblique causes extorsion and elevation against an oblique. So if you see all these six muscles are supplied by the third nerve, except LR6 lateral rectus, which is supplied by the sixth nerve, and superior oblique, which is supplied by the fourth nerve. So all the extraocular muscles are supplied by the third nerve, except LR6 and S44. Yeah, here you can see the extraocular muscles on the nasal side and on the temporal side. Nasal side, medial rectus, temporal side, lateral rectus, nasal side, inferior oblique, Superior oblique, if you go laterally, it is superior rectus and inferior rectus. Arrows denote the main action, main directions of action for each muscle, resulting from a combination of movements of the globe in the three dimensions. The yoke muscles mean the muscles which are responsible for the same movement. For example, if I want to look horizontally, right lateral rectus or left medial rectus. If I want to look to the left, left lateral rectus or right medial rectus. The yoke muscles control extraocular muscles in the six cardinal directions of the gaze. For example, horizontal lateral rectus, medial rectus, lateral rectus, medial rectus, inferior oblique, superior rectus, superior oblique, inferior rectus, or inferior oblique, superior rectus, superior oblique, inferior rectus. Yeah, now let me talk about the individual cranial nerves, third, fourth, and sixth. The oclomotor nerve or third cranial nerve exits, arises from the oclomotor nuclear complex in the midbrain and conveys motor fibers to the extra ocular muscles plus parasympathetic fibers to the pupillary and ciliary body that is for accommodation. The third and fourth nerves are in the midbrain. Five, six, seven, eight cranial nerves are in the pons. Nine, 10, 11, 12 cranial nerves are in the medial oblongata. So this helps us in placing the lesion. If third and fourth nerves are affected, it is midbrain. Five, six, seven, eight are affected, it is in the pons. If nine, 10, 11, 12 cranial nerves are affected, it is in the medial oblongata. One and two cranial nerves are above midbrain. We have a good law good rule known as rule of four. There are four cranial nerves in medial oblongata, 9, 10, 11, 12, four in the pons, 5, 6, 7, 8, four in the midbrain and above. That is three, four in the midbrain, one, two above the midbrain. And what are the cranial nerves which are placed medially? What are the cranial nerves which are placed laterally? The cranial nerves which divide 12 into equal parts are placed medially. That means third and fourth are placed medially because third and fourth can divide 12 into equal parts. 12 by three is four, 12 by four is three. The sixth nerve is also placed medially. 12 by six is two equal parts. The 12th nerve is also placed medially. 12 by 12 is 1. So 3, 4, 6 cranial nerves are placed medially. The other cranial nerves are placed laterally. And another important concept in the brainstem is that the tracks which start with the letter M are placed medially. The tracks which start with the letter S are placed sideways. M for M. The tracks which start with the letter M are placed medially. The tracks which start with the letter S are placed sideways. So what are the tracks which start with the letter M and are placed medially? Motor track, that is the corticospinal track motor part of the cranial nerve nucleus and medial longitudinal fasciculus and medial lemniscus. These are starting with the letter M and are placed medially. The tracks which start with the letter S and place sideways are spinothalamic tract, spinocerebellar tract, sympathetic tract and spinal tract of the trigeminal nerve. So if you know this rule of four, we can easily place the lesion in the brainstem. The third nerve has got a superior and inferior division. The superior division supplies the levator palpebrae superioris and the superior rectus muscle. The inferior division supplies the medial recti and inferior recti, the inferior oblique and the pupil. The superior rectus is innervated by the contralateral subnucleus. 
very important concept because of its cross innervation a major clue to the presence of nuclear third nerve pathway that is in the midbrain is superior rectus equus in the opposite side so if the third nerve is involved you want to know it is in the extra medullary outside the medulla or whether it is in the brain stem just look at the superior rectus involvement if the superior rectus is involved on the opposite side it is in the midbrain because the superior rectus muscle is innervated by the contralateral medial subnucleus because of the cross innervation a major clue to the presence of the nuclear third nerve lesion that is midbrain is the superior rectus weakness in the opposite eye likewise a single midline structure the central caudal nucleus supply the levator palpebrae superiors on the both sides so if it's a midbrain lesion both the levator palpebrae superiors are affected so there'll be bilateral ptosis so if there's a midbrain lesion there'll be bilateral ptosis because both levator palpebrae superior originate from the single subnucleus whereas if it's an which with a fascicular lesion only there'll be unilateral ptosis on that side so midbrain lesion there are two important clues superior rectus is affected on the opposite side and there is bilateral ptosis the edinger subnucleus edinger westphal subnucleus is a single structure that provides parasympathetic innervation to both eyes preganglionic fibers for the edinger westphal nucleus go to the ciliary ganglion post ganglionic fibers derived from the cells in the rostral part of the subnucleus supplying the pupillary sphincter and those derived from the anterior median nucleus supply the ciliary muscle and function in accommodation so very interesting diagram if we know this diagram we can easily know all the details of the third nerve so you can see in the center part you have the edinger westphal nucleus and in the caudal part we have the central caudal nucleus medially we have the superior rectus and laterally we have the inferior rectus inferior oblique and medial rectus nucleus this is the ocular motor nuclear complex in the midbrain so the central caudal nucleus supplies both the levator palpebrae superioris and therefore they have bilateral ptosis the medial subnucleus innervates contralateral superior rectus so contralateral superior rectus only gets affected the lateral subnucleus innervates the ipsilateral inferior oblique and medial and inferior recti the edinger westphal nucleus supplies bilateral parasympathetic innervation to pupillary sphincters and ciliary muscles so this is the ocular motor nuclear complex in the midbrain the nerve exits from the midbrain and passes between the superior cerebellar and posterior cerebral arteries the third nerve pulse is a common and important sign of posterior communicating artery aneurysm so the third nerve goes near the posterior communicating artery and therefore if there is a posterior communicating artery aneurysm it goes and impinges on the third cranial nerve so if a person has got a third cranial nerve palsy always we have to suspect posterior communicating artery aneurysm there is an another important point in its course towards the cavernous sinus it lies on the free edge of the temporal tentorium cerebelli medial to the temporal lobe here it is a risk of compression of uncle herniation so for example a person has sustained head injury there is a hematoma so it goes goes and enlarges goes and starts compressing the midbrain so when it goes and compresses the midbrain the third nerve gets affected the parasympathetic fibers of the third nerve gets compressed and therefore pupil will be dilated on one side known as hutchinson pupil so in a person with a head injury or a bleed if one side the pupil is dilated the other side pupil is normal we have to be very very cautious because he's already got uncle herniation going and compressing the third nerve the parasympathetic fibers on the third nerve are compressed the pupil is dilated on one side the other pupil is normal anisocoria known as hutchinson pupil so if there's anisocoria one side pupil is dilated the other side pupil is normal always think of two possibilities one the posterior communicating artery aneurysm second is the uncle herniation the parasympathetic fibers run superficially on the surface the location of these fibers influences whether third nerve palsy will affect the pupillary fibers for example the parasympathetic fibers run superficially on the third nerve so if there's a compressive lesion coming from above and compressing the third nerve like posterior communicating artery aneurysm or uncle herniation the first thing to get affected is the parasympathetic pupillary fibers which are placed superficially therefore one side the parasympathetic fibers gets constricted the pupil will be dilated the other side pupil is normal whereas if it's an intrinsic palsy of the third nerve like a dyptic third nerve palsy where it affects the third nerve it causes all the manifestations of the third nerve like like diplopia divergent skin and drooping of the eyelid but pupil is not affected because in dyptic third nerve palsy it affects the center of the third nerve whereas the parasympathetic fibers are placed superficially therefore pupil is spared 
In fact, diaptic third nerve palsy is always known as pupillary sparing third nerve palsy. Very, very important concept. Extraneous compression, the pupil is the first to get affected because the pupillary fibers are placed superficially. In intrinsic third nerve palsy, pupils are the last to get affected because the parasympathetic fibers are superficially placed. They are either last to get affected or they do not get affected. So just by looking at the pupil, we can say whether it's an extrinsic third nerve palsy or whether it's an intrinsic third nerve palsy. In the cavernous sinus, third nerve has important relationships with carotid artery, ascending parotid, pericarotid sympathetic, and cranial nerves, fourth, fifth, and sixth. It separates into superior and inferior. So, um, sir, excuse me, sir. Um, so I think uh, you got disconnected from the twins. So you're on mute, so I can't hear you. Yeah, you are able to hear me now, doctor? Ah, yes, sir. Now it is. Yeah, just two minutes. We got it disconnected. I yeah. just yeah. Back. You can we'll edit do. it. Yeah. We'll do, sir. Can I have the share slide, please? Uh, yes, sir. It is. So you can share it now. Yeah. Yes, sir. We can see the slides. Yeah. So we can differentiate whether it's an extraneous compression of the third nerve or intrinsic palsy of the third nerve by looking at the pupillary fibers. If an extraneous compression of the third nerve, the pupillary fibers are the first to get affected, like posterior communicating artery aneurysm or herniation, where it goes and affects the pupillary fibers, which are placed superficially. So one side pupil will be large, the other side pupil is small, anisocoria, that indicates an extraneous compression of the third nerve. Whereas if it's an intrinsic uh, lesion of the third nerve, like diapest, it affects the third nerve, but not the superficially placed uh, pupillary fibers. So a third nerve palsy has got all the manifestations of the third nerve, like ptosis, divergent squint, divergent, but pupils are not affected. In fact, it's known as pupillary sparing third nerve palsy. Pupils are not affected or the last to get affected. So if it's an extraneous compression, pupillary fibers are the first to get affected. If it's an intrinsic palsy of the third nerve, it is the last to get affected. The fourth cranial nerve is the smallest cranial nerve. It it is the only cranial nerve to exit from the brainstem posteriorly. And because of this extra distance, the fourth cranial nerve is the longest intracranial course. It penetrates the dura, enters the cavernous sinus, and supply and enters the superior orbit fissure to supply the superior oblique. Fourth cranial nerve terminates on the superior oblique on the side opposite to the nucleus of the lesion. Again, a very important point. Opposite. So if the superior Oblique, the fourth nerve nucleus affected, superior oblique on the opposite side gets affected. So in a nuclear lesion of the fourth nerve, the contralateral superior oblique is weakened. Whereas if it's an extra medial lesion along the course of the nerve, the ipsilateral superior oblique is involved. So remember S, there are three important points for S. The levator palpebrae superior is bilaterally innervated because the central subnucleus. The superior rectus is innervated by the opposite third nerve nucleus 
and the fourth non nucleus superior oblique causes supplies the opposite superior oblique fourth non nucleus the superior oblique action is to intort and therefore when the superior oblique gets affected persons cannot intort to compensate that they intort their head and then walk this is known as bell shows key sign or head tilt sign so anyone who walks into your clinic with a head tilt always suspect superior oblique palsy superior oblique intorts the eye and therefore when they cannot intort the eye they turn the head to the opposite side to compensate it is known as compensatory head tilt sign or bell shows key sign Finally, the sixth nerve. Sixth nerve lies in the pons encircled by the loops, looping fibers of the facial nerve, exits and ascends the clevis, traverses near the petrous apex. So it goes near the clevis. So if there's a lesion of any clevis, like any tumor, it goes and affects sixth nerve. And very important point is that it's a very slender nerve going around the clevis and very lengthy. And therefore, when there's a raised intracranial tension, it goes and goes and impinges on the midbrain and pons. So because of this raised intracranial pressure, it can transmit the pressure and the sixth nerve can get affected. So sixth nerve per se may not be affected, but because of the raised intracranial tension elsewhere, the sixth nerve is secondarily affected because it's a lengthy course, slender and goes and gets impinged on the clivus. So this is known as false localizing neurological sign. So sixth nerve involvement may be a false localizing neurological sign. So sixth nerve enters the cavernous sinus and it is the only nerve that lies free in the lumen of the sinus. The others are in the wall. It enters the orbit through the superior orbital fissure and innervates the lateral rectus. So if the sixth nerve gets affected, they'll have double vision on looking at far off objects. If third nerve gets affected, they'll have double vision on looking at near objects. Yeah. So what are the common cause of damage to the cranial nerves, third, fourth, and sixth nerve? The damage could be in the brainstem, like infarction, hemorrhage, demyelination, or tumor, or it could be an intrameningeal cause, like meningitis, raised intracranial tension, aneurysm, cerebellopontine angle tumor, or trauma, or in the cavernous sinus, like infection, thrombosis, carotid artery aneurysm, carotid cavernous fistula, or in the superior orbital fissure, like tumor, granuloma, or in the orbit, like vascular infections, tumor, granuloma, tumor. Cavernous sinus is very important. Cavernous sinus, we have third, fourth, sixth nerves, we have internal carotid artery. So if internal carotid artery gets affected, you can have hemiplegia on the opposite side. Third nerve gets affected, you can have parasympathetic involvement. If internal carotid artery, the sympathetic plexus go on the internal carotid plexus, so sympathetic can get affected. So this area, this uh, cavernous, cavernous sinus is one area where there can be involvement of both sympathetic and parasympathetic. And the most common cause of third, fourth, sixth nerve palsies are ischemia infection. I've seen so many persons coming with the isolated cranial nerve palsy, MRI may be normal. Always suspect a small infarction, mild infarction could be because of diabetes. Just put him on antiplatelets and sometimes on steroids, they'll eventually will improve. So very common is ischemic infarction due to diabetes, head trauma tumors at the base of the brain or aneurysm like post communicating artery aneurysm going and affecting the third nerve. We have myasthenia gravis. gravis having the third, fourth, sixth nerve cranial palsies. But very important differentiating point in myasthenia gravis with other cause that myasthenia gravis is a neuromuscular junction disorder of skeletal muscle, not smooth muscle. So pupil is never involved in myasthenia gravis because pupil is a smooth muscle. They may have ptosis, they may have ocular movement disorder, but pupil is always normal in myasthenia gravis. Very, very important point. Myasthenia gravis is a neuromuscular junction disorder of skeletal muscle, not smooth muscle. And another important feature of myasthenia gravis is easy fatigability. For example, if they chew something hard like chicken, initially they may chew it well, but after a few minutes, they may not be able to chew. And at a later point of time, they cannot chew at all because of easy fatigability. So easy fatigability and non-involvement of pupil because it is a smooth muscle are very much in favor of myasthenia gravis. Then we have thyroid ophthalmopathy, Wernicke's encephalopathy, the less common cause are gulen barre syndrome and herpes zoster, giant cell arthritis and ophthalmoplegic migraine. These are the common cause of third, fourth, sixth nerve palsies. Yeah. So this is the way we approach an eye movement disorder, whether it is supranuclear above three, four, six nerves, like a saccadic pathway, pursuit pathway, or vestibular ocular reflex, or optokinetic nystagmus, or between the third, fourth, six, sixth nerve nucleus, like medial long fasciculus getting involved, causing internuclear ophthalmoplegia, or the third, fourth, sixth of infranuclear involvement per se. So if this is the approach, this I feel is the best approach and simplified approach at the bedside.
And most of the neurology concepts, I put in a question and answer format in my book written by me, uh, Focus Neurology, published by CBS Publishers and Distributors. Uh, and it has gone for a reprint in 2018, first time published in 2015. It is available on online from all leading booksellers, including Amazon. If you're interested, you can buy it online, especially useful for orals, because I put neurology in a question and answer format. I've just given an overview of the fantastic and fascinating extraocular movement disorders, neuroophthalmology, supranuclear, internuclear, or infranuclear, just an overview. But if you want individual do details of third nerve, fourth nerve, sixth nerve, saccadic pathway or pursuit pathway, you can go back to my YouTube channel, Dr. Sinwas Medical Concepts, where I have nearly 10,000 subscribers and 250 neurology videos. I think very few uh, neurology YouTube channels as many has got as many as 250 neurology videos. So it'd be a, a really a, very useful for you all. All you need to is to just subscribe to my YouTube channel and share the link with your friends so that you can get the benefit of 250 neurology videos for free. Uh, and I think this is one, one of the very few channels which has got 250 neurology, only neurology videos. Yeah, I thank uh, White Army and Doctor for giving me such a uh, wonderful introduction and kind words. Once again, thanks to Kishan Rao for giving such a great opportunity to address such big and uh, elite crowd. Thank you.